Still waiting to start recording. My side shows recording. Oh, super. Oh, there we go. Uh, all right, hi. Uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, Tuesday, June fifteenth. Um, we have a couple of uh, a couple of updates. Uh, actually, first, speaking of recording, I wanted to get people's opinion. So, I've, I've, the last maybe three or four of these, I we did the recording. We post them to YouTube. When I post them to YouTube, I also watch them again at two x and take quick notes because I'm really bad at taking notes while the meeting is going on. Uh, is that useful to people? Is that is that? Uh, I'll probably still watch them anyway, just to refresh my own brain about what we talked about. But uh, yeah, the note taking or the videos in general. The videos. We're definitely going to do the videos no matter what because that's easy and takes no time to do. Um, but the note taking, uh, I will probably rewatch them again at two x anyway. But that way, uh, if I don't need to take notes while I'm doing that, that would be fine. But if people find those at all useful, I will keep doing that. It was definitely useful when I missed one. It, it's a lot quicker to catch up than watch a video at 2x even. Yeah, okay. And I really appreciate I will, it. I will say, and I heard this feedback from others too, like in the first six to nine weeks of something, like there's a lot of context sharing that doesn't always happen in doc form. Like, you know, it's not, there's not a, a commonly accepted context for what the heck something is. Like this happened a lot during early days of Cube, which is like continuous like reinforcement of, like here's the things that we're talking about, and here's the same things we talked about, and here's like that. That always does have reinforcing value for getting people into a shared worldview. Okay, uh, great. I will I will take that feedback and keep doing notes. Um, Can and, I just um, echo and emphasize a little bit what Clayton said? Right. Yeah. So I tried reading notes. It was, first off, I totally agree with notes, much better than video. Um, but as Clayton said, you know, the early notes did capture all the early context. Um, I mean, I'm, I suppose that's just gone, but if we could either, you know, maybe try a little harder to get that kind of information into future notes, uh, great. Into into meeting notes or, or into like, does that, when we have like a non-community meeting discussion, try to get those notes down too? Either, either, both. All I mean, <laughs> my point is I'm agreeing with Colton, right? Clayton, I'm sorry, that, you know, getting this kind of context is important. So, you know, help those of us who weren't there already to get it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, um, uh, I would like to do a better job of filing issues to track things. I know like a lot of times we say like, oh yeah, we'll follow up with this later and, and uh, don't. So I will try to do an even better job of, of tracking issues and uh, I'll keep doing notes and I'll try to do more notes as we um, have them. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's that's very good feedback. I, I uh, I'm glad to hear that they are useful. I had been doing them for my own use, and uh, if anybody else benefits from them, I will keep doing them. Um, yeah, uh, great. Uh, in in the last week, or actually yesterday, I sent a PR to get us uh, more towards the next the next phase of the demo is to be able to watch resources rebalance across clusters as clusters join and leave and become unready and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, the PR there, number 105, is the first step towards being able to do that with deployments. Uh, prior to this, the PR just uh, noticed a deployment created child deployments for each cluster it currently saw, and then that was it. Uh, after this change, as new clusters join or become unready or or, or whatever happens, um, the deployment controller will see those changes, rebalance, and update existing things, delete deployments as uh, deplete de delete deployment leaves as clusters get deleted, and um, hopefully be able to give us a more uh, flashy, fluid demo of, of watching replicas rebalance across existing uh, clusters. Um, this ties into David's work. David's work is also uh, improving the API negotiation um, logic so that a cluster becomes unready if its types are not compatible in the way that we need them to be. Um, this will be one way that we can demonstrate, uh, you know, why have five clusters? One of the clusters suddenly changed what its definition of a deployment was in an incompatible way. And as a result, the deployment 
replicas there left and you know we're, we're subsumed by the other uh, clusters, but you didn't get a global outage. What you would have gotten before without this multi-cluster and without this uh, API negoci negotiation work is that your, your single cluster no longer knows what the deployment is in the way that you need it to. Uh, and so everything just sort of bursts into flames and everything dies. Um, now, after this and David's change, they will move gracefully over to OK clusters. And so to, to practice the restating the kind of objectives, so there's kind of three things that are useful here. The idea of a control plane for cube that is reactive, the same way that cube is to machine lifecycle with some reasonably like first stabs. And there's been prior art to this, and we're kind of drawing on some of that, but uh, kind of getting a set of new people's brains around all of the problems uh, so that we're not, uh, you know, we don't have to be experts in the, all of the historical problems, but like we're kind of getting ourselves in a, in a like Jason and uh, David after this will be in kind of a mental spot where they're like, oh, I thought about these problems enough that now I'm dangerous and I can expand my danger by going and learning about other projects and where they've failed and all that. And the difference between earlier projects is this is the API variability which is with control over APIs flexibly, we gain a new tool that lets us move up the food chain in terms of the amount of damage and havoc we can cause. Uh, two, that this would be useful for an end user, which is I would like to just use deployments like I do today and have a net new feature. Uh, this will set us up so that we can then test the hypothesis that how many of the other resources do you need? Do you need replica sets? Do you need pods? What are the ways, like demo three or prototype three phase is like, okay, can we go mitigate the lack of replica sets or pods? And then the third one I think is opening the door to uh, what are the, understanding all the open questions for the world of APIs can change. Uh, APIs are what really matter in a declarative system, having good declarative APIs, some of which are gonna be the cube resources, some of which are these future, what are the mechanisms and tools that we would need that allow us to have APIs that can be composed into sets for the purposes of being a control plane for everything? So that would be um, that would open the door to like if someone wants to do a twelve factor app, um, and I'm just going to pick on Heroku here. So like, what if Heroku broke their API in an incompatible manner, or what if you wanted to unify Heroku and Cloud Foundry and Knative behind one twelve factor? deployment object that's simpler, um, what would it mean to have a, a type, a controller that comes along and is like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go from Knative to, uh, or I'm gonna go from Cloud Foundry or uh, Heroku to Knative. Uh, how do I make that API change reasonable at this control plane layer? Maybe the controllers get swapped out, but the API didn't change, what would I have to do? So that's kind of setting up that third phase of, what if APIs are fungible? So those kind of the goals of this whole perk. Is that useful for resetting context? I think, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. And we should, re and this is like a good thing too, is like in the prototyping phase, um, we should practice restating what our value is at all times uh, so that we're testing the hypothesis that what we're building is actually valuable. I'll, I'll, I'll say I'm still a little bit confused sure that I understand what you mean about API fungibility. I think I heard you talk about um, something that was uh, centrally engineered and kept coherent across the clusters. And earlier I saw discussions of, well, what if the different target clusters had different versions of some APIs? Yeah, that, that might be interesting. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the demo I plan to do just we have a second step of this meeting. Uh, I started working on on you know a prototype of of exactly this. I mean, uh, when connected to two, for example, two physical clusters, and pulling the uh, API definition of deployments, for example, for each physical cluster, and then it happens that you know you have pulled the first definition, then it's been um, accepted as the you know uh, API of development of deployments in your KCP logical cluster, and then when a second physical cluster comes in, it's not the same, and if it's not compatible, then we would check if the second API for deployments is compatible. If it's not, if we agree, you know, taking the LCD of both models and, and working with that in our 
uh, logical cluster, or if it if we don't agree taking the LCD of this, then one of the of both physical cluster would be marked as not supporting this API. So there is some you know negotiation here that has to occur, so that we are sure that everything that we accepted in, in as APIs inside the logical cluster um, is consistent. And, and if there is any change that breaks this consistency, that then we would be, I mean, admin typically would be, would have the ability to, to know that before, uh, you know, possibly forcing this or changing the API. Yeah, and Mike, like, uh... Like why are APIs important? So if you're building a declarative API system that's unmoored from physical infrastructure, um, you might have multiple uh, agents acting on it. Their life cycle and their API evolution is managed, right? Like so a cube cluster, um, cube guarantees that we never regress or break APIs, which means all APIs are forward compatible, but occasionally we deprecate or remove beta APIs. CRDs have a number of API evolution gaps thinking about this is, even though this isn't the short-term goal, the setup for this is thinking about long-term evolution of APIs. Um, how do you manage the software lifecycle of declarative APIs over a long period of time as a control plane? Because the whole point of a control plane is um, you don't accidentally screw up and then delete everything in the known universe because you made a one-off typo error that blew up your entire cloud infrastructure. So depending on what the problem space is, um, we'll go in different directions, but it, reinforcing the APIs and their evolution is a key part of a long-term value proposition of something that's not a physical cluster. Many people today moving across clusters have this problem and that's where we're pragmatically starting. But the longer term goal is just, uh, you know, how would you help ensure that APIs don't regress over time? And I think right. even even a um, uh, a thing that I'm excited for David to build, even though he doesn't know he's building it yet, is a a thing a, a tool that you can plug into CI to see a CRD definition on the left and on the right, and say that this will be a compatible change. You are not introducing a breaking change. <laughs> um, that is like outside. We should also operationalize that and run it in the in the reconciler and make it be something that we detect when it when it hits the cluster. But the code that you are writing is also something we could package into a you know take a look at a CRD definition diff and see if it is. Yeah. I don't I don't think yeah. such a thing exists today, and I think that would be a useful. Yeah, tool. well, I, I look that quite much, but um, in fact, uh, at least it doesn't exist in Go um, in you know semantic differencing. I mean, uh, yeah. in fact, subtyping detection, which is mainly what we want to 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 have. And so I started something as, as a library that is then used in, in the corresponding uh, controller that I have been working on. But of course, uh, for this library, I just did the minimal because it's in fact quite complicated because you know JSON schema can, can represent the same semantic meaning with many, many different ways. Uh, so for now, I left a number of things just you know unimplemented, but you get an error if there are some changes that we cannot detect uh, if they are compatible or not. But mainly, the main points, uh, hopefully, in the, the main types in Kubernetes, do not use those type of those you know advanced JSON schema stuff like uh, any of or <coughs> uh, you know cumbersome uh, combinations of those. So for now, I mean, it should at least cover the the, the typical uh, Kubernetes. Uh, objects, but then it would be very easy to just because the the hover the, all the cases are there that they are just not implemented. Then it would be very easy for other people to contribute and complete that. And of course, it could be used also for even for use cases with CRDs. I mean, currently currently use CRDs where you want to check uh, through CI that you didn't ch include a change that would make it you know backward incompatible without incrementing the kubernetes api uh, api version for example so it could be very useful and i also took the approach of limiting this to um structural schemas which makes it more i mean much simpler than the general case of course because structural schemas uh, cut a number of of you know <laughs> JSON schema weirdness that you can have with you know even properties being defined inside constraints and stuff like that, which 
hopefully it doesn't exist in structural schemas. Um, David, you talked earlier about negotiation. Are you imagining this is something humans are involved in or is, is some automated process? So, I mean, I've been working, uh, maybe I'll try to, sh to showcase uh, quickly later, but I've been working on some idea or prototype of something that is, we, we could say, semi-automatic. Uh, let me explain. If you add a cluster, then you would have an automatic uh, mechanism that will pull, uh, you know, re the, the APIs you're interested in from the physical cluster into the logical cluster as API resource import object. Then you have one API resource import for an API version and a physical cluster. And it contains the schema mainly and the definition, you know, everything that you typically have in a CRD version. And then um, the negotiation will occur uh, if you if you have, of course, only one API resource import, then it will create one negotiated API resource, which is a, a distinct object with the same schema. But then if you have two, if you add a second uh, API resource import from another physical cluster, then it will uh, compare the schema of this second import of the same API with the schema uh, that you have on your negotiated API um, uh, resource object, which is uh, which we have you have only one of uh, in, in for a, a given logical cluster. And then um, the semi-automatic part of so all this is automatic but then the, the semi-automatic part of it is that you can uh, in your negotiated api um, resource uh, resource api object um you can you have an um, i mean i added a, a field which is publish or not because what you, you may want to you know to have let's say 10 physical cluster join which do not have the same uh, Kubernetes, you mean the same version of your API, the same schema exactly. You you may want those ten physical clusters to join your uh, physical cluster before accepting or publishing the, the 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 API that results from the least common denominator of all these you know APIs coming of all these versions of the API coming from physical clusters. So by default, it creates a negotiated uh, API resource object but which is not published but of course it's just a question we could just decide to publish it automatically and then when you publish it it, it would create the crd uh, in your logical cluster that corresponds to the least common denominator of all the corresponding apis imported from your physical clusters but then if you have a an uh, 11th uh, cluster as soon as it's published as a crd in your logical cluster if you had a, an Add an eleventh um, physical cluster whose API for the same, you know, API version is not compatible with the existing LCD. Then you would not be able to change it. You would just get an, a, a status with an error message conflict on your API resource import. And then that means that you know, even you could, you know, have a UI where you can see what are all my imports for from for this logical clusters. And those with, with, which are, you know, conflicting, and those with, which are compatible and published in my logical cluster. So with these two, uh, just two additional objects, you can have a automate as much as possible, but still keep provide, you know, um, um, freedom for for uh, checking the impacts and and acting uh, accordingly. Does it does it make sense? Does it answer your question? I, I think I got some idea of what you what you described. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would just maybe do a yeah, bit yeah, yeah, as, as much as as much as we can do automatically, we will try to do automatically. But when it breaks down and needs a human to kick it into working again, a human can kick it into working again. Uh, and hopefully, when a human has ruled, uh, a new uh, a new joiner doesn't un doesn't unfix it, right? Uh, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, that's the, the, rules, that's the, the, the satisfying the part, right? Because yeah. what you mean is basically someone is going to decide, OK, I've kind of finished growing now, and, and no further growth yeah, or exactly. diversity is, is really supported. Um, yeah. That's uh, OK as a starting point. I think we're going to need to go beyond that at some point. Yeah, probably. And there is something that I didn't mention is 
um, that you can enforce uh, the, the schema, in fact, the CRD. Uh, if you add a CRD yourself in your logical cluster, let me say I would add the deployment CRD that I extracted or built myself in, your logic, in my logical cluster, then that means that the negotiated um, API resource, um, yeah, API resource for, for this API is enforced to the, to the schema of the CRD that I added manually. So that means that in such a case, whatever you add, whatever API comes from um, physical clusters would never impact uh, your, your uh, API, you know, in your logical cluster because it has been enforced by you or an admin explicitly adding a CRD for this type. And in such a case, it would still continue doing automatically the work, but only the, the check work. You know, you have no, if you enforced the schema of the of the API yourself by adding a CRD in your logical cluster, then the only thing that occurs when you add a physical cluster with this API is compatibility check and setting the status on the API import object. So you still have the way to, the ability to enforce or to bring them, you know, iteratively until you decide you publish the corresponding API um, externally in your logical cluster. Yeah. Have you, uh, just a quick question, have you prototyped any of this schema reconciliation with, with schemata of any complexity yet? Because it sounds impossible to me. Like yeah. it sounds just freaking impossible to me. So I'm like curious whether this has actually been tried yet. <laughs> well, I, I'm doing that currently on on deployments, but yeah, I mean, I mean, let let, let me. Put actually, it in way. so it'd be useful, Eric. Why do you think it's impossible? What parts of it that are most impossible? This the least common denominator thing, um, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm just you know misunderstanding the the concept. But like you're not talking about taking v1 of a of a crd and v2 of a crd you want to, right? so, no with yeah. the same version v1 okay. and v2 so like uh, so there's a uh, syntactic changes so like changing the name of a column right and there's compatible schema changes so like let's talk like databases right you have a yeah. schema and a table you can add a column what do you yeah. have to do if you have to add a column you have to provide a default why do you have to provide a default because things that were reading the column before still have to provide whatever the row was. Um, you can't remove a column without breaking a schema. So effectively right. remove a column, all writers have to change. So like thinking about this, like V1 as we define it in cube is the set of additions that are compatible with V1. Yeah. There's a small set where occasionally people screw up where like they'll add a validation rule. Right. Violates, that's a, that's so, so what I might, so my, so, so the point is that we are assuming well-behaved schema evolution within a version. And to be fair, we can test that because the sinker is effectively a distributed test mechanism of... I, I don't doubt that we can test that. I What I doubt no, no, is, I mean, that, is that existing, like existing evolved schemata out there don't Necess are not necessarily well behaved in this regard, and so therefore would just simply not be supported in this but environment. There's actually not that much difference between knowing ahead of time that the schema is incompatible and what happens when your controller gets, for instance, a 429 error when it tries to sync that. So if you think about like the two, there's like the, yeah, you're right. Most, to, to, well, so first off, if you want to have a public API and it's not a good API, uh, there's a self-selection factor. People stop using your good, your API because they can't trust it. You're not a good candidate for declarative config if you change what the API means under the covers and everybody breaks. Mm. So there's a there's one filter there. The filter that's left would be uh, meaningful, actionable changes and unintentional, subtle changes. It's like so let's say that's 90-10. The 90 is what David's working on. The 10 would be I go to sync it. And I get a 429. Is that really all that different from an availability failure or a thing? And the sinker does have one superpower that GitOps may not is because the sinker is designed as a config loop around these types. Think about the superpower that the sinker has, which is it can say, you know what? 
See you later, cluster. If we can get to a point where we can test that hypothesis, there is a set of the 10% that this you screw up where we're like, oh, the person delivering the code that implemented that operator on that cluster screwed up. Unintentional API change. We have two other clusters that are still working perfectly fine. Pull it out, flag it as an error, same way that you would for an incompatible schema change. The, the yeah. like 90 catches the upfront. Mm -hmm. The 10 catches the, the after the fact. And the 10% kind of looks not that much different from operations team screwed up and so forth. So I think we can maybe get 9% or let's let's call it. So you, you add another nine to what you can handle for API evolution. What do you do with that last 1%? Nobody's perfect, subtle like behavior change. That's where you then need the next loop, which is, hey, how do I know that this instance on this cluster is running correctly? Well, I have a health check. What happens when that health check fails? I evacuate it. How do I get someone to define that health check? I have to incentivize them. In pods, we have a health check. What if, for instance, we had a location app health check that looked a little bit like an SLO, and when that SLO fails on one of the three clusters, we say, oh, one of our sensors has told us the cluster that just happened, you know what? We've got extra capacity, let's go. And again, these are like three successive systems, but like at the meta level, yeah. there are systems we do not have, and there are systems that could potentially be generally useful in theory. And that's how you go from one nine to two nines to three nines in this particular domain. Will we get there? I don't know. But like, can you see that progression? That's kind of the thought process. Right, where yep. each order of magnitude of improvement is actually an order of magnitude harder to implement. It's a new, also. it's a new technological loop. Now, the best outcome would be, we we get to the prototype stage, we test this out, we find like you know, hey, like actually, if we could convince people to write deployment level health checks, and we could fit that into the system, that's generally useful even on a single cube cluster. No doubt. And so, like, how would we work through that? We don't know yet, but like, it opens the door for that, and that. Uh, a cluster is a faded uh, life cycle uh, failure domain. In theory, we're working around a cluster as a failure domain, but an, a set of APIs and a set of software is also a failure domain. Having two failure domains, if we can layer them mm. correctly, could get us that next level up. But then you could bring it to a single cluster and you get the benefit, which is like, oh, well, like, the reason why your cluster failed, like say you have one cluster and you've got this running on top of one cluster, we could tell you we have the same systems in place. So every cube cluster out there could potentially benefit from, hey, you were willing to use your same apps at a higher level, but you added a few, a little bit more. And we can tell you, oh, your admin screwed it up when they upgraded because it's not compatible or <laughs> validation mm -hmm. failed, or your SLOs failed and the SLOs were useful as well. So thinking about those three systems is orthogonal to, but stackable on top of cube. So I think you're absolutely right that uh, detecting this will be hard. Remediating it automatically will be an order of magnitude harder. And like scaling this for all types, for all possible types and all possible diffs of types is a ton of work. The idea is not to make it perfect. The idea is to make it possible. It doesn't exist today. So yeah. anything we do is an improvement on the state of the art. And yeah, like using the, the investment we're making improves the three areas. So that's why that extra, like, I think Jason, you captured it perfectly. It's like, we've got to go do a bunch of work to do APIs. Then you got to figure out API evolution. Everybody has the API evolution problem today. It is a percentage. It is a, it is reason why some SLAs fail on cube. Then the next level up is single cluster failure, or correlated failure domains. That's another nine on the cube reliability or, or just general teams on top of cube reliability. Mm -hmm. And then the, the movement, if you can get the movement in, you actually give a solution to both of those problems, but you've also added in a new layer that you can then use even in the app. So it's like, we're looking for, we're gonna put a bunch of investment in and get three benefits. The, the Venn diagram, hopefully, and this is why we're prototyping overlaps. Yeah, and so, I, think, I think that's why I'm excited that the, uh, that the code to detect it at all is is new, uh, exciting experimental code that if it works, we don't we can give it to people when they are making PRs on their code, right? Like if if we can detect yeah. it, we can detect it hours, days, months before they ever roll it out, mm -hmm. and when they roll it out, if we if that's the only time we've detected it, 
So we that's the use case that I wanted to, that I was kind of coming at this from, was that I'm thinking of this in terms of using this setup to do rapid API development, where I'm going to make mistakes, I'm going to oh, make yeah. API mistakes. <laughs> and I want to be able to still, like, I want that not to, like, implode the whole thing on me, right? right. But I guess if I'm using it correctly, if I only roll out my latest PR to one logical cluster, watch that guy blow up and decide, oh, that change sucked and revert it or fix it or whatever, right? Yeah. That's then that's my model, right? And then, yes. and then to Mike's question earlier about like, there's like the, you're looking at the underlying clusters and summarizing them in a control plane. You just brought up, I think the other loop, which is I'm rolling out changes at the higher level. How would I roll it out? Well, for instance, what if I created a staging logical cluster that had the new version of my API and I have controllers running on that new API and I can test that that correctly deploys to the underlying clusters. The same tool that might work at a, at a controller running on the underlying cluster or in a single node case or on kind or whatever, also could work at the control plane level. So in theory, we have a tool that can help us do controller evolution or, and like controller is like a stand-in, but like you could say, what do most people doing iterative development on APIs build? You know, they have schema migration tools and all that. How do they test in the world? They deploy it. It runs isolated. It has no dependencies. But how would you test as an operations team or infrastructure or app infra, the meta stuff that runs the other stuff is you want to be able to use those tools and bring them in, but also have the environment be amenable to, um, like I could kind of, you could see, look at logical clusters and APIs being exposed into them as a form of feature gating, which is like, how would you roll out a yes. change to tens of thousands of applications by evolving your API. You want to do you know, some form of feature gating, you want to do some first stage. As we start playing around with this, can we use those tools that we're thinking about in that novel way, like including them in a logical cluster that you can stand up and run and like, well, I can use all the other parts because all those guys don't care about the one bit of difference. But the only difference about this logical cluster, I've got like a, say I've got a thousand logical clusters and 99 of, 999 of them are running um, the operator integration, I can test the new one. All the other APIs from all the other logical clusters or all the other controllers could be fitting in, but I've only changed that one API and then I filtered out the other controller from accessing it, thinking about how we get there. And like we, we this is basically a problem that tools like OLM um, and other like controller management lifecycle things is most people don't have tools that let them work with this. I'm not sure our goal is going to be like in the short run, deliver all these tools, but starting to think about, well, you know, if, if you want to be the declarative API for everything and you want to have these declarative APIs, what are the tools that help you roll out new changes to declarative APIs? Oh, we have a pattern and process that lets you roll out new API changes. Uh, so Clayton, yeah. let me just make sure I just test my understanding of what you're talking about. When you talk about logical clusters, we're talking about uh, another KCP hub so you talk about a thousand logical clusters that are running over the same set of physical clusters. So you're talking about a, a thousand KCP hubs all talking to the same target or physical clusters. Um, I mean, yeah, like look, an instance of KCP could run against one cluster. It could run against a thousand clusters. Um, let's say a KCP server is just as valid a target for APIs and controllers as a physical cluster. Right now, we're mostly thinking about APIs that are on physical clusters and summarizing them but there's a set of additional orthogonal tools that KCP would have that currently Cube does not, such as letting you have 15 versions of the same API and letting your controllers talk to a subset of them. Like maybe your controllers at some point say, hey, go get me all of the clusters that have this version of my API, not just V1, but this V1 that matches the schema criteria in which case you can bring a new version of the API out and bring a new version of the controller that only selects the logical clusters that have that new version of the API. Again, this is just like, think about this as like ideas that we want to open the door to go ask later. They should overlap in terms of helping you roll out new versions of declarative APIs, no matter what layer they're at. Um, yeah. So were you yeah, ta right. just talking about a two level hierarchy then? one root KCP talking to some intermediate node KCPs talking to leaf physical clusters? 
Um, it might be. I mean, there's. I think there's. We we are we are probably pretty early on. I think you could come up with different topologies, and we haven't really made any opinions there. But yeah, you could imagine a hierarchies of APIs. You could imagine um, logic like this being bolted on alongside KCP because it's a library. And you could imagine someone being like, "This sounds complicated. All I want to do is run transparent multi-cluster applications." Um, I would say best outcome would be we're focusing on transparent multi-cluster first because it is concrete, pragmatic, and helps us open the door to these other problems. Someone who wanted to could definitely go hack in that direction. It's not like our immediate focus, but we really want to set up that. As Eric said, like we're trying to get to a point where we're bringing advantages that could then reinforce and multiply, not five different advantages. They're like, we're chasing this and this and this and this. So we'll have a little bit of pruning where we might not go after some things because they they don't reinforce the overall story of making things more operationally reliable. So again, so I'm sorry, I'm just you know new and slow here. Uh, you talked about a multiplicity of logical clusters. Um, I outlined one way to where scenario where that might be. You seem to think there are others. Can you outline other scenarios where there might be a thousand logical clusters and what else is, is in the scenario? Um, so the set of APIs exposed into a logical cluster is not just CRDs installed. It could be anything, right? The point of KCP or Cube API server as a library is Cube API server happens to be very CRD focused or minimal KCPs or minimal API servers. Like they tend to use CRDs as a stand in. There's nothing that says they have to be code. Like that's kind of one dimensional thinking. Um, it helps when we're talking about, we've got some basic stuff and we're gonna go look at these clusters and calculate CRDs and put them into namespaces. But there's no reason that that's the only way that we could operate. Um, it's just for right now, it's like the purposes of this demo we're exploring, the prototype we're exploring those, those setups. But for instance, another example would be, um, you've got a, um, an API server or a server somewhere that exposes a list of open API objects. And dynamically, you build a cache by just fetching all of those and you turn them into CRDs, which then feeds them to another bit of cube code, which then exposes them as static APIs and CRDs never enter the picture. There's no reason that you know the, the CRDs have to be real CRDs. There's no reason that um, they could be files on disk, they could be an etcd, they could be in a logical cluster, they could be on a different server. So I think right now we're just trying to work through patterns that feel familiar to people. So don't don't get yeah. too caught up on the, the future stuff. Yeah, and clearly uh, we are we are trying to use what we have in Cube because uh, as as many of you know, I assume, uh, CRDs are quite are you know quite very tied to how Kubernetes is, is defined. I mean so and API API service and CRDs and CRD controllers are quite deep into into cube, cube code. So I mean, using CRDs to CRD let's say machinery to import APIs and make them available in in KCP uh, instance is obviously um, I mean the most straightforward way uh, until now. But then. Uh, even even if if we're in, in in the prototype I started and and we spoke of now, um, I didn't add you know any CRD notion. The notions are API import and negotiated API resource because what what we want is mainly just define the schemas of um, the APIs that should be exposed uh, outside from a logical cluster. So I'm really confused. I'm sorry. Like this is again some basic context setting. Um, I, I guess my problem, uh, Clayton, uh, I, I didn't clearly express the depth of my confusion. I wasn't trying to go to the future. I was trying to understand your thoughts about the present. Um, I apparently don't understand what a logical cluster is. Um, I think I've, and I don't fully understand what David said, how that's not talking about CRDs. Um, I kind of understand the idea of a KCP as a, a hub that talks to multiple physical clusters. Um, and if logical cluster doesn't mean hub or physical cluster, I'm not clear on what it means. No, sorry. So, okay, so uh, KCP is like a Cube API server. So that's all it is, stripped out a bunch of the other Cube crap, right? So start with a Cube API server. Now add the idea that if you set a certain request header, um, 
the Cube API server that was saying like, hey, I looked at etcd, and I looked at all the objects in etcd, and here's all the objects in etcd that are under this key. Instead, added a prefix to that that was the name of a logical cluster. And the name of the logical cluster is foo. So instead of getting slash in etcd, instead of getting like slash, um, slash pods, uh, return all pods, everything under the slash pods key, and then the Cube API server interprets that into pods in different namespaces, where namespace is another key segment. So like pod slash foo, or pod slash bar is all pods in namespace bar. Imagine if you put a prefix in front of it, where pods, the, the prefix, is a shortcut for saying this particular version of a pod. You put another prefix in front of this said the logical cluster. And so the logical cluster name, let's say it's foo, when I make a get pod, get all pods request, um, instead of the key in etcd that's being looked up is slash pods, it's slash foo slash pods. And then if I wanted to get all pods across all logical clusters, someone could, again, set up request header or something like this completely arbitrary that says like star. And it would go say, oh, don't put that prefix in. Go get everything. And then each of the pods that gets returned, you'd get pod, uh, pod uh, baz. From namespace bar. Okay. From logical so, cluster. Food. Okay. So logical, logical cluster is then. Uh, okay. So it's just another level of namespace mechanism within the hub. Right. And, and the implementation of that is based on an etcd. But you could also imagine an approach where there's a thousand etcds, and each logical cluster points to one etcd, or some you know something in between. Um, where there's just a mapping of like, hey, if you come in with logical cluster foo, go talk to this etcd with this prefix, and then. Um, how logical clusters are created, like the, the policies and all that, just treat those as completely undefined. It's just a mechanism. But to Cube's perspective, Cube's going to serve for a given cluster an API endpoint that says, here's all the open API objects, here's all the resources. Hacking that is effectively what the logical cluster enables, which is each logical cluster could expose a different set of Cube APIs and CRDs. So if you create a CRD in a logical cluster, the bit of code in Cube that's like, here's the open API, doc this is what David's already done. The API document for logical cluster foo would have the CRDs that kind of get inherited from some, or the, the resources that get inherited from everywhere, the CRDs that get inherited from a, log a different logical cluster, and the CRD that's in this logical cluster are combined and composited together what David's working on is effectively something that goes and helps create some of those CRD objects. So the end result to a consumer looks like the union slash intersection of, you know, if you have two different real clusters, go get their objects, turn them into CRDs, and then surface them out through a logical cluster. So to an end user looking at that logical cluster, they're like, well, I got a pod. The set of fields in that pod are calculated by David as the union of the pods on each individual cluster. Uh, un union, you mean, or yeah, or LCD? LCD. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and and to to be fair, what I what I've been working on is is mainly a prototype. I mean, whose main goal was allowing us to play with that because until now, I mean, the the rules of what uh, how do we detect when there is an incompatibility. Um, the rules um, according to which uh, we decide that we can still enforce the change in the negotiated uh, API, etc. All these were not really clear, so which is why I started with these two, you know, uh, uh, objects, CRDs, uh, API resource import and a negotiated API resource, so that and and it's it's on purpose decoupled from the CRD. I mean, finally, you can just. Uh, decide creating the uh, a CRD into inside your logical cluster. I mean, publishing your API, but but then you could still just work, and and that's the goal. We could still just you know run the controller of the negotiation with those two objects and just play with it and see how does it react when you add manually uh, ten API resource import uh, for you know with associated to 10 distinct locations. And here again, I just do not directly refer to clusters, but just to uh, an opaque uh, location uh, uh, string. So, I mean, you have several API resource import for a given API uh, name, for a given API, and that are uh, associated to various locations they come from, they were imported from, 
and then you have one resulting uh, negotiated API resource. And of course, for the sake of, of what we already have and what KCP already provides, then it's plugged to uh, with cluster on one hand uh, and, and CRDs uh, in, in the logical cluster on the other hand, so that we can have the, the whole flow and, and, and have the existing demos work uh, the same. But the whole point is that we would be able to create API resource import even manually if you would like to, you know, manually import a given API that doesn't come from a physical cluster, for example. But the whole point is is not to have something, you know, final, but 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 something, you know, sufficiently um, built so that we can start playing with that. Uh, and that you know other people and KCP users can um, you know have a consistent behavior when when importing distinct APIs or different APIs from from different clusters, physical clusters. And then, I mean, to me, it's just a start of discussion. Then then we can discuss on something that is more uh, concrete. I mean, at least that that's the goal. Yeah, I really, I really like this idea of having a, it's like a draft CRD. Like, we put these two CRD definitions together, and this is what we came up with. It's not a CRD yet. Yeah, it's, yeah, what, it's, it's what, we would, what we would put together if we had put these two things together, or yeah, in fact, it, it's, things together. Uh, exactly. And, it's just the, the, the result of the negotiation yeah. that, by default, is, is, you know, to be accepted by, you know, the admin. And then, of course, we can decide that we accept that automatically and publish that automatically. But, but at least that gives, if if needed, that gives you know the ability to look into it and decide what we do with that. Yeah, Mike, does that uh, does that answer any part of your question or lead you to more questions? Uh, I uh... that answers a lot. Um, okay. I just want to, to uh, ask one more thing. So we're talking about multiple logical clusters. Again, in a hub that sits in some sense above or aside from many physical clusters. So when David talks about importing from locations, he can talk. He's talking about importing either from a physical cluster or a different logical cluster. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I mean, for now, uh, how it's plugged into the existing system is only from physical clusters because we we've, we've not gone that far to uh, as importing. You know. APIs from one logical cluster to another one, uh, but um, it could be, I mean, this exactly the same way because an import is just, you know, in, in this prototype, it's just uh, an object. So you could just create a, an API resource import from APIs that are, and, and even, you know, even the, the um, API import mechanisms, so it, it reads on an existing cluster that you access from your cube config, it reads the both the discovery um, endpoint and the open API schema that are exposed publicly, and from that uh, rebuilds the, the 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 open API v3 schema and and the and a sort of CRD in fact. So you could even it's it's you know it's quite straightforward. Instead of pointing to to a physical cluster, just point to the logical cluster with the cube config of your KCP logical cluster. And then you would be able to import objects from it exactly the same way. Because from, from inside KCP, it's just transparent. You're pointing to some cube config context. Does it make sense? Yeah, make sense? I, think, I think it's really, the really, really key point is a logical cluster and a physical cluster should be indistinguishable from the perspective of yeah, a yeah. customer. There are a set of standard cube APIs for discovery, for understanding what types are there. Yeah. If you're not using them, if you're assuming that pods exist, that's like a, that's just a, a legacy element of our system. But uh, KCP as an idea, logical clusters as a mechanism, minimal API servers, everything's just a cluster you can talk to. Cluster as a useful bucket of types of APIs and instances of those things with one tenant concept the namespace within it that's built in and everything else is up to you use as you wish get rid of tenant get rid of namespaces if you wish etc 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 yeah i think a lot of these fall into the the bucket of uh graduating existing concepts to the next level like 
CRDs are currently cluster scoped. They're still going to be cluster scoped. We just need a concept of something larger than a, you know, a, a we've been trying, we've been grasping for a word for what is not a cluster, but. Uh, and honestly, like this, um, so there's like a thread going on right now that like cuts right to the heart of the challenges with this in Cube. Like CRDs aren't feature complete compared to code. And so today you make a trade off yeah. between a general purpose, but limited CRD, which helps because yeah. it kind of behaves the same. Or you use a built-in that gives you all the power and flexibility and not all the cube types can work well as built-ins because of validation and other rules. Ideally, as a project, we converge those. What are the mechanisms that make converging easier? Um, it might actually be at the end of the day that like CRDs get dramatically improved in cube and it gets easier to sprinkle code among them or tie it. We're not there yet and probably won't be for a while, but a lot of this work kind of opens the door for like, well, if we only had to use CRDs for internal types, <laughs> where are the gaps? We see those like almost immediately. David fixed a bunch of them, um, and those trade offs get pushed back, which is like, okay, well, like, what do we really need to go be able to run a, uh, an awesome API server? Well, I need code at a meta level, like webhooks. Um, webhooks suck operationally. Could we improve webhooks? So, like, this is stuff we talked about in previous meetings and all that. But the idea, Mike, as much as possible, is um, find overlapping areas where Cube itself can be improved. If CRDs don't work well, how do we do better at, at uh, mm -hmm. implementing them? Yeah, and, and maybe I would add that that the implement add to that. Sorry, that the implementation currently of the prototype I started working on is is using you know controllers completely, so completely static. When you add a new API resource import, it would you know recalculate the LCD and the compatibility, because everything uh, CRD wise on Kubernetes is based on controllers and and is done upfront for now. So, I mean. <laughs> uh, if we want to have something without rebuilding the whole you know uh, stuff then we have to cope with that but in the future of course as clayton already told several times even crds i mean even i mean resulting schemas for for api resources could be calculated on the fly or merged on the fly or cached or in a way that is less upfront and you know static uh, than than controllers and so obviously the, the the current work also would would change in in such a situation and and become something much more you know di dynamic but but for now it seems that the, the the simplest way to do that is just to you know have two two new type of objects and then controllers that 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 do the the compatibility check and lcd building um cool and and Mike, if you have more questions, please, uh, uh, you know, ask them. I, I don't, I don't want anybody to get the mistaken impression that we all know what we're all talking about. So, uh, if something we're talking about is unclear, it's probably because we haven't fully thought it out, or, uh, or, or are incapable of communicating it clearly. And in either case, we should do, uh, we should do better. So, um, uh, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Great. Uh, on that, I mean, we have five minutes left. Uh, it sounds like David is working on uh, this negotiation stuff, and we'll have uh, something to show soon. I'll have rebalancing in response to cluster changes soon. Uh, after deployments, I was going to tackle daemon sets, uh, and I am uh, I am trying to commit myself to going through some of the motions on. Um... What are the real obstacles to uh, if we only had demon sets but didn't sync pods? Like if pods didn't come back, because like I think that's the fundamental like scale challenge is if we're delegating, can we still give you an operational experience? Um, was exploring that yesterday with a few people uh, as we were talking about like security models and what we would do. So I'll hopefully try to put that under as just more exploration doc work. You mean um, the, the experience of someone who's talking to a KCP, giving it daemon sets, and having those propagate down to clusters. But I, I can see the aggregated status of that daemon set at the KCP level, but I can't see any of the pods. Yeah, yeah. Like the default state right now is we have a tool where we can summarize the status. What's the experiential gap? So I'm going to spend some time on that exploring like mentally and try to get something either in a doc or like some discussion, because that will lead to like while you're kind of going at pragmatic sync, Jason, this will be the, what are the things that aren't sync that paper over the experience loss for someone who comes in and like, I created a deployment, but the heck are my replica sets? How do I do pod logs? So going through a couple of those aspects and listing out the options and generating some input that'll be for third round of 
prototype. So is it related to you know defining some settings for all the type of resources and, and pass through rules? Yeah, and stuff like yeah that. But it, just like a really, really, really insanely high level, there'd be like pass through <laughs> where it's like, hey, we've got two locations in this namespace. When you call the pod namespace call, we go make a pod namespace call to the two clusters, hmm. summarize them and return them in a single list. Why would that fail? Well, first off, what if the names collide? Um, then there's other aspects like what if you wanted to create a pod because the top layer, you're like, I want to just go create a pod to go run something on a cluster. I don't care where it is. What if you choose the same name? So thinking through some of these cases, coming up with examples, mm -hmm. capture examples, um, the, I, to me, it's like uh, this is surfacing. So we're kind of in the pragmatic, like we think we can do CRD negotiation. We think we can do logical cluster tenancy. We think we can do policy under logical clusters. And I think we can do an amazing amount of things with APIs. We think we can do uh, syncing and modification. What we don't know whether we can do is paper in all the rest of the gaps so that yeah. someone who creates a deployment gets the experience they want. So I'm just going to do some prep uh, pathfinding there and then hopefully have something that someone can then go prototype down or we can have some discussions. It's probably a little bit more of a discussion because I think we have to explore the idea space. Yeah, even, even uh, related to that is right now when you give KCP a deployment, it will go create other deployments for you, right? Uh, and we might not want to show you those. We might only want to show you the deployment you created with aggregated status of these fake, you know, behind the scenes deployments we created for you. But um, not even hiding the pods under those deployments, but hiding the shards of those deployments. Um, yeah, or, or even, even uh, concluding whether we really, really, sorry, whether we really need to create them because as we said, we could also mix the sinker and the yeah. and the splitter. I mean, just sync while doing some changes on the fly. Yeah. So and there's, there's other angles too, which is, yeah, if we could surface back info about the individual shards, that's a tool that KubeFed never had. So KubeFed was full object doing syncing, uh, doing complex things for each syncing. Uh, trying to open up the possibilities of like how would we go in a different direction and try to address the challenges that KubeFed had, circling back to um, maybe this is intractable because like there's still the percentage chance that we're like well we can do all these other things but we can't actually make transparent multi-cluster work. Maybe we should rethink. Um, yeah, actually, I'm interested in edge, and I think a lot of edge scenarios you don't actually want it to be transparent anyway. Absolutely, yeah, and and right. that was brought up. Did we talk about that in the last meeting, Jason? Yeah, well, we it, it's a recurring topic that transparent is, you know, only mostly transparent. Uh, transparent right well, now is like, could you co-opt the entire cube ecosystem so that everybody who's just using cube today would just as well prefer to do this? That's like a uh, uh, growth hack or a uh, yeah. collaboration hack or a community hack, which is like, how do you make it matter to the biggest community possible? But you're right, Mike, like all of those long tail use cases, uh, whether they're long tail in scale, long tail in specialization, long tail in library. We definitely want to enable those, but we need the big multiplier where it's like, this applies to everybody. Oh, and we're all working on the same tools, a little bit like how Cube kind of did for, you know, everybody kind of looks at Cube and sees their own thing. We want everybody to be able to look at the KCP idea and be able to use those same tools. Yeah. Uh, with that, I think we have hit time. Uh, I will post a recording and notes as soon as I can. Thanks, everyone. Good discussion. Uh, we'll see you next Thanks. week.